<laughs> okay. Um, hi. So just before I begin, I just want to say um, I have not written any books. I will not be showing. Oh, I will not be opening terminal. There is no code. <laughs> Does anyone want to run away? Okay. Excellent. Um, so user interfaces. I think everybody in the in their pockets, in their bags right now, you guys will have a laptop. You guys will have your phone. A lot of times. This is a way of going into the digital system to use software. Yeah, phones and uh, web apps. And in my previous life in, in enterprise, every time we had a design thinking workshop, the end product is always, let's design an app. It is so boring. <laughs> and of course, <clears throat> when my friend told me the opportunity, like, hey, come to Bangladesh. Anyone from Bangladesh? No? So he said, hey, let, let's go to Bangladesh. There's an opportunity. I'm like, holy crap, do I really need to? But okay, I mean, it's, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting uh, seven months. And one of the few things when I was doing my research is, has anyone seen this? This is a project out of MIT Media Labs. So it's called, um, I can't remember what it's called, but basically it is tangible user interface. This is a very different way of interacting with software. So beneath all these cool tiles is actually actuators. So instead of having one pixel, one block is a pixel that you can touch, okay? And of course, we're all geeks. I hope you guys know what this is. IT crowd, um, you can watch it legally on Netflix, all right? <laughs> so, the purpose of this talk today is mostly about voice, and um, it is becoming more mainstream. There's, of course, Amazon Echo and using Alexa. HomePod, sadly, which has been delayed to next year. So this, this was an announcement by Apple, I think, yesterday. And of course, there's also Google Home. And for most of us using, using Apple products, there's, of course, Siri. That has been around for a while. Now, what exactly does this entail? For all of us here, I believe that none of you have uh, visual um, imperities. You know, you're not visually blind. And a lot of the times when we're using um, the current UI that we are using, it is for a specific demographic in our society, people who can see. So we move on to say voice. This guy, even though he has superpowers, he's able to interact with software. Old people who, who may be more, um, who may have challenges to see, they're able to also use software either through actuators and, and the tangible user interface or through voice. And of course, the demographic that I build for at the moment is the illiterate. They are unable to understand uh, words. They're not able to understand um, letters and alphabets. So which is why the only way for them to interact with software is through voice. The 40 numbers for tomorrow night. <laughs> no, actually, if you guys have the, the privilege of calling these folks, who here has an excellent experience dealing with these guys? <laughs> I take that as a yes, right? Or maybe even anyone from banking? No? Okay. And most of the time when you call these people, yeah, this is what you get, right? Press one for this, press two for that. But by the time it reaches 13, you're like, holy crap, and there's a prompt for you to say, press asterisk to go back to the main menu and repeat this crap again. So this is really where voice user interface is at at the moment. It's really bad. And that's what most of us feel like, if not worse. And you know, in, in case you're really interested, there's actually this interesting website that tells you the shortcut and how to hack these crappy systems, like what to press immediately to get to a human. So why do we need something like this? And what is missing? Right now, you know, for, for software people, we're still building on the premise of a GUI. We're still looking at a menu. Has anyone tried ordering McDonald's via phone? No? You will not get the prompt to say, hey, press one for Big Mac, press two for McNuggets, press three for whatever, right? Because that menu is this long, correct? And it's, it's not possible, it doesn't make sense. It's a whole different medium altogether. So if it's one takeaway from today from my talk, I hope that you can figure out that, hey, one, it's a whole new different medium that you're designing for. So think about how you want to do it properly, not through a menu configuration. It will be totally different. Yeah, so menu are meant for eyes, not the ears. 
And you must understand that what happens is when you see something, you're able to process things a lot faster. Light travels a lot faster than the speed of sound. So by the time things reaches you and you process it through your audio cortex, it's going to take time. And of course, who, who here really hates the fact that when you speak to Google or when you speak to Siri, um, especially if you're using Chinese names, right? Like, please call Chen Yi Chao. And it's like, are you trying to call blah, 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 blah? <laughs> yes or no? So I think to me personally, when I designed uh, the system in Bangladesh, I removed this all together. Because I don't think there is a need for it. it. It really slows down the process. It's very painful. And what do we have right now? Um, Jeopardy. Natural language processing. So I think for Archie's talk, he did come up with some parts of natural language processing, like tokenization, and the tree generation, which leads to, to I guess, engram formation in a way. At the same time, there's now this whole big buzz of chatbots. So we all need all these little pieces before we can get to a really, really good uh, voice user interface. But the caveat, speech is not text. Now, let me give you an example. Let's just say in the heat of the moment, I am with my partner and we are making out. And she tells me, please don't stop. Yeah? How is that going to be trans transcribed? Three words, right? Please don't stop. What if I were to change this a little bit? And my partner tells me, please don't, uh, no, please don't stop. <laughs> In the transcription, it's the same three words, correct? But from a voice perspective, it is totally different. One of them would probably mean that I will get sued in another 14, 15 years when I run for election, and this comes out. The second one, if I don't do it right, means I might need to look for a new partner, which could be worse. So one of the other thoughts that I had in mind when I was shopping and there was suddenly a fire alarm is, this is actually a voice user interface as well. When you visit a shopping mall and there's suddenly this, this announcement, like everybody please head to the fire exits. It's a voice user interface. It's a very primitive one, but it works. It conveys the message across. So <clears throat> right now, I think voice is still very primitive. It's still a one-way um, channel until we can really build a really good natural language processor, until chatbots reach a level whereby um, scripting becomes, and scripts and dialogues becomes more intuitive. So I think this is where, um, as, as an engineer by training, I think this is where the people from arts would be able to help us to create something that makes more sense. Um, especially, you know, in, in the time when we were all laughing at our, at our arts uh, friends like, ah, ha, ha, you can't get a job. But in the future to come, I think these people would have uh, much, they have a lot to contribute in, in the technical scene because we need things to be more human, especially with AI. And for now, um, the only thing that we can do is to really have uh, voice in short bursts. So what I mean by that is that it, since it's, it's, it's single directional, right, one way, so things should happen quickly, within five to 10 seconds. Anything more than that, we just don't have the patience to sit through and listen to a menu. So for the foreseeable two years, sorry, at least in my opinion, I don't think anything cool is gonna happen we need all this information to come out. We need all this data sets to be created. And um, there is limited use cases at the moment, um, but I think it, it will take minimum two years before we catch on. And I think this is a really, really good area to build on when nobody else is looking into it. So if, if your company is still looking at building apps, web apps, try something else. You might be able to grow your user base from your existing group to somebody even bigger. And if you're interested in the presentation, this is the bit.ly link. Um, if you wish to spam me with the now new 280 characters, that's my Twitter handle. So that's it, thank you very much. Oh, so um, like, like the Japanese rail, I, I apologize for such a <laughs> fast talk. <laughs> I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Sorry, what's 
So normally when I introduce myself, uh, it's like bitch with a Y. It's, it's quite simple. <laughs> <laughs> So at Starbucks they wrote bitchy, so I, I don't know. I need to work on that, that introduction. Right? <laughs> um, so in case anyone is really interested in what we do in Bangladesh, because of um, the constraints of technology, there's not much data, so we actually use GSM phone calls. So people would call in and um, it's a very poor country, and in order to try to reduce uh, interest rates, so there's microfinancing. So in order to reduce interest rates, we want to give the poor population a chance to have software, um, especially accounting software, whereby they have a chance to prove that, hey, we have all these transactions and we have all these uh, past um, records, so that when they present to the banks or the microfinancial banks, um, it helps to reduce the, the interest rates when they, they borrow money for their own business. So this is why we're using voice user interface. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, you, you touched on uh, on uh, like the richness of the voice a little bit. Uh, can you can you uh, say a little bit more? Like okay. where are we today uh, with this type of interpreting? So interpretation wise, uh, normally is normally speech to text. Um, if anyone here is from Google. <laughs> When I took on the job, I thought Google actually had a speech-to-text for Bengali, which is the prominent language in, in Bangladesh, but sadly they don't. So we had to build our own. Um, and that has been a very painful process. So I had to go through some, some um, journal papers to figure out how to do it. And I think normally there's a term in linguistics called phonemes, whereby, to me, I interpret it as syllables. So when you break up a word, there's the sounds of how you um, speak. So speak is one syllable, so speak. Um, or interpretation would be interpretation, so something like four or five, right? So these are, these are individual sounds which are classified as phonemes and they are unique, it's a, it's a fingerprint, it's a signature for that specific word. Um, it works across all languages. It, to me, I, at least from what I understand, this works across all languages. Um, so the example that I gave about uh, the partner, right? That would be termed under something called prosody. Uh, P-O-R-S-O P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. So it's a, it's a flow, it's a cadence of how you speak. And this is something that speech-to-text is not able to pick up. And most of the time, which is why when you convert speech-to-text and text-to-speech again, um, it feels very robotic. No matter, you know, Baidu has an awesome speech engine, but it still feels very robotic. Um, it doesn't give you that emotion. Um, and if, if you get um, Google to say, read out, um, Count of Monte Cristo, you will not feel that angst, that, that need for revenge. It would just be a robot reading the book to you. And I think that's still something that's missing, that we can't really interpret. Maybe with emoji code? I don't know. <laughs> might, might be possible, right? We can, we can insert emojis. But as of now, it, it's still very challenging to, to pick up all these um, emotions. And it is also very difficult to interpret over voice. So right now you're looking at me, or say the camera's looking at me, and when people play back this video, there are these awesome hand gestures, yeah, and the awesome facial expressions that help to add on to that interpretation. So a lot of times communication, voice, and, and, and uh, the words that are being used is only maybe 20-30% of the context. But the additional context comes from um, <clears throat> the tone, the prosody, uh, the hand gestures, the facial expressions, which we can't really codify at the moment. It's, it's very challenging. Have you tried using musical notation for Frosty? Uh, thought about it. That was actually my master thesis to look at uh, time series, like frequency time series. But as of now, I'm still trying to solve the Bengali issue first. Like, <laughs> do, do to my corpus. <laughs> so uh, coming back to the, have you looked at all in the like the cochlear implants? No, actually no. So a cochlear implant is a uh, like for people who have a damage to the middle or inner ear. ear. Uh, we can insert a, a, an electrode and stimulate the, the auditory nerve. And the interesting part is that, um, so it's also interpretation of sound through microphone and to a signal analysis to record it and so on. And the interesting thing is six electrodes is enough to, uh, to stimulate uh, and give, a, like, give people back almost full capacity to hear. People can talk over phone mm. using only six frequencies of stimulation. 
So it's, it's a very basic interpretation of, of, of audio, but to people up across the brain, it's probably adds a lot more than what we can do in the machine. That is an interesting thing to look at. Absolutely. I think I definitely want to take a look at that. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, well, I'll be hanging around to six. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. Normally, I don't like long presentations as well. So I've given this talk before at uh, a different talk. Um, it was equally short. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.